Today's scripture lesson comes from the gospel according to Matthew. If you would like to follow along, you may do so on page three of the New Testament section of your pew Bible. Matthew 4, verses 18 to 25. Jesus calls the first disciples. As he walked by the Sea of Galilee, he saw two brothers, Simon, who was called Peter, and Andrew, his brother, casting a net into the sea. For they were fishermen. And he said to them, Follow me. I will make you fish for people. Immediately, they left their nets and followed him. As he went from there, he saw two other brothers, James, son of Zebedee, and his brother John, in the boat with their father, Zebedee, mending their nets, and he called them. Immediately, they left the boat and their father and followed him. Now, Jesus went throughout Galilee, teaching in their synagogues and proclaiming the good news of the kingdom and curing every disease and every sickness among the people. So his fame spread throughout all of Syria, and they brought to him all the sick, those who were inflicted with various diseases and pains, demoniacs, paralytics, and he cured them. And great crowds followed him from Galilee, the Decapolis, Jerusalem, Judea, and from beyond the Jordan. Let us pray. Gracious God, give us ears to hear, eyes to see, and hearts that are open to receive and respond to your word, to your message to us this day. Amen. So I'm not sure if you are familiar with TED Talks. Have any of you watched a TED Talk? So a few hands go up. TED Ideas Worth Spreading. It's a series of collaboration all across the world of people with inspiring stories or insights. And, uh, and they'll go to conferences, sometimes large or small, and they'll record them. And the hope is to generate these ideas around the globe, ideas that can spark a movement. Uh, very popular, these TED Talks. One of my favorite TED Talks, which is actually ranked the third most popular, it's received 56 million views on the TED website, not including YouTube or any other website, which that's a lot of views if you think about 56 million people have watched this. It's called Start With The Why, How Great Leaders Inspire Everyone to Take Action. It's a TED Talk by Simon Sinek who wrote a book entitled that, Start With The Why. Now, the book starts with comparing the two main ways to influence human behavior, in his opinion, manipulation and inspiration. Sinek argues in his TED Talk and in the book that inspiration is the more powerful and the more sustainable of the two. He highlights the importance of taking the risk of going against the status quo to find solutions for global problems. And he believes that leadership holds the key for solving our world's issues. So throughout the, the brief talk, which I do commend, and also the book, he turns to leaders such as Dr. Martin Luther King Jr., John F. Kennedy, Steve Jobs, and actually the entire Apple industry culture as examples of how a purpose can be created to inspire an entire culture. He says that people are inspired by a sense of purpose. That's front and center. He calls it the why. And that this should come first. Understanding the why should come first when communicating before the how and the what. People always want to know, how do I do that? What do we do? 
But he said that real leaders and, and change begins with the why. You start with the why. He calls this the golden circle. And in the center of this bullseye is the why. And then from that flows how. How do we live out the why? How do we live out our purpose? And then the what. What exactly will it look like for us as a community? So as we enter a new era here at Stowe Community Church, over the next few weeks, I want to take a look at our why, as stated in the purpose statement located in your bulletin. And I believe you will see at the back of it, it's in an oval, I guess that would be an oval, a blue oval. And maybe you haven't noticed that for a while, but I do want you to take a notice and to, to, to look at it and to read. The Stowe Community Church develops loving followers of Christ who celebrate through worship, grow through teaching, connect through fellowship, care through service, and share through outreach to our community and our world. So this Sunday, I want to look at what does it mean to be a loving follower of Christ? That's the first thing you read. That we as a community exist, our purpose, our why, is to develop loving followers of Christ. What does that mean? What does that look like for us today? So we just read a very interesting story of a leader who helped reshape an entire culture and start a global movement. His name, Jesus, whose invitation to local fishermen was, was so compelling that they left everything they knew and for two of them, even their father, which maybe wasn't a hard decision to make, I don't know. But they left everything they had in order to follow this leader. And I have to be honest, and maybe you thought this when we, when we read that scripture together. Why did they do that? Why did they leave their livelihood and everything behind? What was so compelling about this person or this message or this invitation would I leave everything I had to venture into the unknown? These are hard questions for self-reflection. But I do think that the key for the answer, as we look into their stories, lies actually in understanding the Jewish educational background and knowing a bit more about just Jewish background in general will help give frame to this story. I have to say a special note of appreciation to some of my good friends over the past 15 years, Rabbi Tom Cohen, Rabbi Vicki Axe, and Rabbi Mitch Hurwitz, who have become dear friends among colleagues and clergy and who helped shape and deepen my appreciation for Jewish culture and background and history and have been excellent teachers for me personally. So it's important to know that Jesus was a Jew. And he was a Jewish rabbi. Now that's actually really important to know because his culture and everything about him was thoroughly Jewish. And he was a Jewish rabbi. Now the Torah, the teachings, those are the, the five books of the first five books of, of the Old Testament. The Jewish scriptures are called the Torah. But they're also called the teachings or the instructions or Jewish people would refer to him as the way. This is the way. The Torah is the way. And the Torah was center. I mean, and is, and, but back in the day of Jesus, it was center, the foundation of their lives. Not just religious life, educational life, societal life. The Torah was center of life. And it was, certainly was the focus of their educational system as well. So here's what's really, really fascinating. Most Jewish boys and girls would begin school around the age of six at a local synagogue, and they'd be instructed by a local Torah teacher. So not dissimilar to, to our educational system at the age of six. And there was different levels of this. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to teach a little bit of Jewish cultural and educational uh, background so, so we will all know. There's the first level that everyone is welcome to. It's called Beit Sefer. All right? Beit Sefer. Now, in Beit Sefer, which lasted around four years, most children would memorize 
the scriptures and have the Torah memorized by heart. Every word, all five books. Can you imagine? I see a couple of students in here. Can you imagine that requirement for your first level of education? Here's the works of Charles Dickens. Memorize it all. That's challenging. By the, a by the end of Bates' affair, most would no longer be going to school. For obvious reasons, you know. But then they would go and they would become apprentices in their family vocations. Managing a household, learning the family trade like carpentry or farming or fishing. You know, by around the age of 10 or so. But the best, those who could actually memorize the Torah, would move on to the next level. Beit Talmud. Beit Talmud is the next level. Now, this was only for those with the most natural ability. They would then memorize the rest of the Hebrew scriptures. Genesis through Malachi. Now, I want you to do something. Take your red Bible. Take a look. Pages like 1 all the way to 890, roughly. And just flip through that. They had to memorize all of that. You talk about a rigid educational system. So by the end of Beit Talmud, most, by far the majority of 14 to 15 year olds are no longer in the educational system to be, to be a rabbi. They're learning the family trade or the business and they're fully immersed in the family trade. But there is one more level, if you can believe it. There is one more level, Beit Midrash. Now at Beit Midrash, it works a little bit differently. They've already graduated, if you will, these first few levels. They would then go to a rabbi and apply to be a disciple. Now, a disciple was more than just a student. They wanted to know more than just what the rabbi knew. A disciple wanted to be like the rabbi. A disciple wanted to learn and to be equipped and empowered to do what the rabbi did. And you talk about a hard application process. It makes applying to an Ivy League school seem really, really simple. But this was for the creme de la creme, the best of the best. And the rabbi wants to know, can this individual do what I do? Does this person have what it takes? Because most did not. This was a hard application process. And if you were good, now remember how good you must be to get to this level, right? Think about that. I would be disqualified for sure, maybe most of us. But if you were good, but you weren't the best, the rabbi would say these words. Go, blessing upon you and your household. Go and learn your family trade. The rabbi would bless this young student and bless their family and say, go and learn your family trade. But if this person was the best of the best, the rabbi believed that this person had what it took to do what he did, to be like him, the rabbi would use these three words. Come, follow me. This, friends, was the Jewish way. And so, if you heard those words from a rabbi, you knew you had made it. There was no higher level to go. That was the pinnacle of achievement of success, to hear a rabbi say those three words to you. And so, at the age of around 15 or 16, you would then leave. You would leave your family, you would leave your friends, you would leave your village, you would then devote your entire life to follow your rabbi, learning to do what your rabbi did. Now we know from history that most rabbis would begin their teaching around the age of 30, which now brings us to our story this morning. 
Jesus, around the age of 30, a rabbi, walking along the shoreline of the Sea of Galilee and sees these young fishermen who are probably 15, 16, 17 years old, maybe early 20s. But here's what's very interesting, friends. These individuals, they're not following another rabbi, are they? They didn't make the cut, did they? Not one of them made the cut. They were not the best of the best. And yet, here they see a rabbi walking the shores, looking at them, and saying these three words to them individually. Come, follow me. Can you imagine what hearing those words did to them? Think about it. And I love one adaptation in film on this scene. When Peter, Simon, hears these words, he's shocked, as you can now imagine why he would be shocked. And he asks Jesus, what are we going to do? And Jesus leans in and kind of gives him a wink and says, we're going to change the world. I love that. I like to believe that that was part of the conversation in the dialogue because that's exactly what they did. So we read Jesus issues this invitation. Jesus clearly sees something in Peter and his brother and the others that they did not see in themselves. In fact, that maybe no one else saw in them. Jesus sees potential where others saw failure. Jesus sees possibility where others saw flaws. Jesus sees strengths where others saw weaknesses. You know, you, you often hear these, this term, it's, it's important to believe in God. Yes. But what about God believing in you? Have you ever thought about that? Belief in God is important. Yes. But what about God's belief in you? And that's what this story is all about. God believing in all of us. And I think that's true for us today. We've had people that have come through the systems and the structures all around society. And they've often been told or taught or modeled, you're not good enough. You don't have what it takes. I hear people say, I just lost my way. I lost sight of, of who I really was. I kept hearing the noise and the voices of others giving me uh, my identity and shaping my identity. And when we're not confident in who we are, God believing in you, then we do start to hear those other words and voices saying we're not good enough or we don't have what it takes. We're not smart enough or brave enough or beautiful enough or rich enough or you can fill in the blanks. In order for us to be loved or to be cared about or to make a difference in this world. Or we're just plain scared or unsure to leave places of familiarity behind. And who wouldn't be? But when we hear those words that come to each and every one of us. And when we believe in ourselves and who God has equipped us to be. We can do what Christ did. We, everyone here, can be a follower of Christ. So what did Jesus do? I mean, what does it mean to be a loving follower of Christ? Well, as we read in the text later on in that passage, and we know throughout scriptures, he brought good news to all people, especially those who were downtrodden, those who were poor, those who just needed a word of encouragement. He released those who were in captivity in whatever chains they found themselves in. He healed the sick. He fed people. He welcomed and included outcasts and all those who were marginalized by society. That's what Jesus did. That's what followers of Jesus can do. 
He made every person he encountered feel better about themselves and feel better about God. That's what Jesus did. He called a group of misfit fishermen, tax collectors, and religious outcasts to turn the world upside down and to usher in a whole new way of thinking and living. His why, going back to Simon Sinek, was to begin a revolution, a revolution of love, to go against the status quo, which is what Jesus did. They went against the status quo of the day, and they made acceptance, inclusion, forgiveness become the norm for people who were followers of Christ. In fact, his followers, the first disciples, were known as followers of the way, long before they were ever called Christians. Followers of the way. And I love that term. The way of grace. The way of forgiveness. The way of inclusion. The way of hospitality. The way of kindness. It is the way of love. I once had a mentor of mine, Reverend Scott Herr, while we were serving together at the American Church in Paris, say this. He said, if your reading and understanding of the Bible doesn't make you a more loving person, you're probably reading it wrong. Boy, that really spoke to me. Because we are called to be formed to be more loving in all that we do, in all that we say. That's what the world needs. It doesn't need more religion. It needs more loving people getting out there into the world, into the societies that we live. So our why is to become loving followers of Christ. Loving God, loving self, and loving others. And the good news is each and every one of us has received an invitation. Everyone, regardless of your background, regardless of your status, regardless of your knowledge, is an invitation. Come, follow me. And friends, when we hear that, when we leave our nets behind, whatever's holding us back, whatever's dragging, and we say yes, we can change the world. One person, one life at a time. Amen.